Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Bonacord Mayor Brian Holden. The town of Bonacord, Alberta, is rooted in agriculture with a rich history beginning in the late 1800s. Early development in and around present-day Bonacord was led by Scottish immigrants who came to settle and work the land. A meeting of locals resulted in the name Bonacord District, chosen due to settlers' familiar connection to the city of Aberdeen, Scotland. Bonacord, meaning good agreement, is the motto for Aberdeen, derived in the 14th century. Now, the town recognizes the importance of environmental sustainability as a key prerequisite to the successful community. The town has embraced an integrated community sustainability program to ensure long-term viability and sustainability. The plan includes goals to garner and increase community support, focus on business development, retention and attraction of families, as well as the implementation of a plan for infrastructure expansion and replacement. Bonacourt is and will continue to be viable and sustainable both economically and environmentally. So stay tuned as we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Brian Holden. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit. And I've got to ask the question I've started off all my interviews with, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Brian? Well, it actually goes back quite a ways. Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you right off the bat now that uh, I never once in most of my life even thought of municipal government. And uh, there was a time in my life where, where, where things happened and a passion grew in me uh, where I ended up, pardon me, I ended up in a volunteer position for 13 years at the Young Offender Center in Edmonton. And it was probably then that a passion for helping people uh, started to grow within me. Uh, unfortunately, I, I also had a, a want to do something for the community that I've lived in for so many years. I've been here for over 30 years and uh, I couldn't do it because the job that I had at the time, I traveled a lot. Uh, seldom at home, but I made sure that I was home Friday evenings because that's when I went to the Young Offender Center. Then eventually I changed jobs and I at later in life changed careers and went to work for uh, a boys ranch uh, as a child and youth worker. Again, working with young people, some in trouble, some just uh, very traumatized from their past and so on. And again, I couldn't do anything with the town because I worked a nine day week. I was six days on and three days off. So uh, I, I could not commit to any meetings or events. So uh, after 15 months, there was an election in town in 2017. And I thought, wow, I said, maybe this is my chance to, to give back to the town. So I went to a couple of meetings and I, got my first real look at municipal governance. And I thought, well, you know what, I could do that. But I still, I didn't have a passion. I, the, I had a passion to do something, but I didn't have a passion for governance, that's for sure. And uh, so I ran for mayor. I ran for a council rather, not for mayor. And uh, I got in. 
I, I knocked on every single door while I was campaigning in town. And doing that, I, I, I spent very little time talking and almost all of my time listening to these people. And I learned a lot. I learned that a lot of their needs were not being met. I thought that the, 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 the uh, council before us did a pretty good job. But I started to realize that there were a lot of needs not being met or hadn't been addressed, I guess. Uh, can I, can so, I ask a follow-up question on that for a second before you continue course. on? Sure. Um, you, you, you're you a relatively long-term resident of Monacord from what you've just said. I think, if I'm not mistaken, you were born and raised there, right? Or did you move to no. as a young kid? Oh, not even. I moved, I moved, I moved to Bonacord in 1993. Okay. So I'm older than I look. <laughs> Okay. Knowing that, I would assume, and I hate to assume, you should never assume as they say in politics, because you know what it makes you, but yep. um, I'm going to guess that you relatively had an idea of what was going on in your community. But you're saying you were shocked when you were actually listening to the people at the doors. You were sort of taken back because the issues that they were raising weren't being addressed were those issues related to the municipal realm or were they provincial and federal jurisdictional issues or were they more micro municipal issues that people were concerned about that their issues weren't being addressed? They were mostly municipal. Uh, I guess the closest thing to, to government would be taxes. Of course, everybody was against the taxes. And, uh, and so was I at one time until I realized where the money comes from to <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to deliver the services that we do. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the reason I asked that question is, so you've now ran in two elections, 2017 as a councillor and 20, 2021, which you were claimed as mayor. Correct me if I'm wrong here. That's but correct. You, do you, how do you engage with your residents? Because when I was on the Bon Accord website, community engagement, community uh, involvement has been is prominent on the town's website about what's going on. How do you see yourself filling that role to engage with people, to hear their concerns and not just assume that you're going to hear them every four years at an election cycle, that you're addressing the issues here and now in 2024 instead of 2025 when the next election comes around? Well, it's it's interesting that you ask that question because I have a list of challenges here, <laughs> and it's odd, I know, but uh, <laughs> community engagement is is one of them. It's uh, it, it, you know, a lot of my contact with the community is, is and I'll qualify this is by accident. Uh, my wife will ask me to go up to the post office, and I'll go to the post office, and an hour and a half later, I'll get back home, and we're like, where were you? So I've run into a couple of people and and have some interesting conversations. I've also joined the the seniors group here in town. So I, I get involved a lot with the seniors, and who are really important people in this town. Uh, we have events such as uh, council council connection or council community connection in uh, in our chambers, and and when the weather warms up, we have it in one of our parks. Uh, which is a hit and miss thing. And we're, we're trying to figure out what the magic formula is for that. One time we'll have, a, have a, a meeting and we'll fill a room and the next time two people will show up. So it's, it's, it's really a difficult thing for that, for that connection. A lot of people, I, I guess if we have something uh, like a topic and uh, people, some people will come out that, are interested in that topic. Sometimes it's only one or two. And other times we'll leave it open to whatever they want to talk about. And sometimes it's only two, or sometimes it's 22. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing. And, and it's pretty well the same in most, most uh, municipalities, I believe. Do you get a sense that there's an apathetic nature when it comes to municipal government in Bon Accord? When you actually want people to give their opinion, you, you sort of talk about the, the challenges of whether you hold an event, there's two people or even there's 22 people. Will people give you their true, honest feedback on what what 
decisions are being made at council or is there an apathetic nature of as long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on at the end of the day i really don't don't really want to know what's going on in council because that's that's watching the sausage being made and at the end of the day no one truly wants to watch the sausage being made they just want the sausages to be ready and barbecued for four o'clock at when it needs yeah. to be <laughs> yeah uh you know what is it's a mix it's it's a mix for sure uh i have a lot of people will will come up to me and and talk about what happened in council all of our meetings are streamed on youtube yep and 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 that video is left there for two weeks so some some meetings uh we have a lot of people watch them they might watch them when they get home from work rather than during the meeting time and so on so i will get comments on on stuff that we talk about and most of it's positive most of it's positive we we always have the naysayers uh you don't say mayor one. you don't say that there's naysayers in municipal politics that's mind-blowing here Okay, I didn't mean it. Yeah, uh, it's it's funny. We have, just to give you an idea about naysayers and how my mind has changed about them, uh, about not all of them, but most of them. Uh, I walk down the street to go to the post office and I walk past Centennial Park and I watched this huge monstrosity of an amphitheater going in. And I'm saying to myself, what on earth are these people thinking about? How much money are we paying for that? And And so on. That'll never get used. So I was a true naysayer. Fortunately, I only said that to a couple of people and my wife. Uh, the rest of it I kept inside, and I kind of stewed about it. Well, we have a thing now called Music in the Park, and it goes all summer, every Tuesday night. Uh, we have a different band every night, and we have over 100 people show up every single time. And now I look and think, wow, that <laughs> council that was on previous to us had a lot of foresight. When they put that thing in uh so the, and that happens to a lot of the naysayers it brings up a good question and it leads into the role of the mayor and council as a whole after now seven years on council i can imagine you have come to the realization you are not going to please a hundred percent of the people in your community with a hundred percent of the decisions you make there's always going to be people who disagree or think they you could have done better or done a better job or gotten a better service out of the services provided. How do you make those decisions that impact people's lives the most? Because you don't go to Edmonton to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You make a decision. You have to live with the consequences of whether that is going to be a good decision that people are going to accept or people are just going to say, why did you make that decision, Brian? Tell me, explain to me what made you decide that that this was the best path forward for your our municipality. Is it hard in the Bon Accord to make those tough decisions knowing that you're not going to please 100% of the people? I think it's always hard for everybody. Uh, and I guess the first thing that I would say to them is to ask them to try and remember that I didn't make that decision. We made that decision as a team, as a group. Uh, we have four councillors, one mayor, and during those meetings, I'm a counselor and I add to the discussions. <laughs> it's uh, sometimes it's hard, you know, sometimes those decisions aren't decisions that I would have made personally. But uh, that's the good thing about having a good diverse council when we hear it from every uh, personality comes out in that council meeting and and <laughs> sometimes good, sometimes not so good, but usually good. And uh, quite often I will sit there and go, oh, I never thought of it that way. And I'll change my mind and uh, and I'll go with it, even though it's going to upset some people. We know for sure that it is going to be for the good of the community itself, for the good of all of the people in the long run. You've had to make some very tough choices over the last few years as a counselor, then as a mayor, and whether that be through COVID-19, whether that be through this budget cycle that we're currently going through or last year's budget cycle because of the economic downturn that we have, are, are you finding it more in, compared to when you first started in 2017 to now, while the decisions are tough, is it getting tougher because of the uh, economic reality that we live in? Absolutely. Uh, we 
I don't want to get into dollars and cents too much here, but. No, and I don't don't either. I just want to talk about the decision-making process because that's the hardest part that I think a lot of people don't understand. And and I I say this with respect to the people who are potentially listening across Canada because I have listeners across Canada and around the world. The decisions you make, you're not just pulling them out of a hat and saying, this is what's going to go on. You sit there in a council meeting and you have to make those tough decisions even if it means raising taxes 1%, 2%, or even just leaving it uh, at zero and service levels are going to be uh, get uh, affected because things go up in price. Everything goes up in price. So I'm not saying that we're going to talk about dollars and cents. I want to talk about the decision-making process because you have to make some very tough choices, do you not? Uh, we do. We do for sure. Uh, but we, we have a budget, as yeah. everyone else does. And uh, we know that in order for us to uh, deliver excellence in service delivery, that we have to stick with that budget. And sometimes it's a hard choice to make when you say, look, we're, we're, we're going to raise taxes two and a half percent, which actually is pretty good compared to a lot of, a lot of municipalities around. And, uh, but there's still a lot of folks out there that will get upset about that. And this year is going to be even higher because uh of the assessments uh all of the assessments in this town have gone up considerably so that's going to be a hit to the to the residents too as far as taxes go so it 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 is really hard it's a hard decision to make and uh we all try not to take it personal we try not to act emotionally and it's all for the good of of the town uh, we need to move forward in the town. We can't stay stagnant. And there are people in town that do not want us to move forward because it costs too much money. But uh, I've always believed if you if you're not moving forward, you're going backwards, and it's uh, it could be a big problem. Before I turn to the issues that are affecting Bonacord as a whole, I want to ask one sort of follow up question that I did not prepare you for, and I, wa- I want to ask your advice. Being on council for seven years, you now know the interworkings of a municipal council. And there are people who are probably just like you in 2016 who didn't really pay attention or, as you said, never thought about municipal government until you decided to go to those meetings and get involved and actually take part and run in that first election. What advice would you give that prospective candidate, that person who is like you in 2016, who really isn't thinking about municipal governments, but should and get involved in their local community through an election or through giving back through a board or committee? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, You know, most of the people that I talk to in that respect are, are, are folks that may complain about something. And, and we'll get into their story and, and I will tell them that, you know what, and not with malice, but tell them you need to get on council and you'll have a better idea or go to some council meetings and that might spark something in you. Uh, it, it's, it's not an easy choice for a lot of people just to go to, to go to council period, even to watch a meeting. So I, I really don't know how to answer that question, Chris. It's, it's, uh. It's, nope. it's all I, a matter of choice and matter of personality. I, I appreciate the honesty there. So I want to turn to the issues of the uh, the town as a whole. But before I ask this question, as I always do on the show, I'm going to preface this conversation by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. He is one member of five on city on town council. He is one vote on town council. While the while the talk that we're about to have may line up to what is being discussed at the town council meetings. Uh, This is his opinion and his opinion alone. For those who are about to send me emails, I thank you for your (laughs) feedback and I appreciate it. (laughs) Mayor, in your opinion, as of this recording, as of us talking right here right now on April 2nd, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing the town of Bon Accord today? Uh, Man. I've got two that that are that are big, and one is infrastructure. Let's talk about both of them then. So, if you want to talk about both of them, let's talk about both. So, infrastructure is the first one. Why is that? And and both of them together put us between a rock and a hard place. Infrastructure, like most 
small communities uh, that have been around for a long time have aging infrastructure. And of course, what's happened with the, with the economy over the past couple of years is when I look back to 2017, for example, we were seeing uh, funds from the government that were about, I don't know, three, four hundred thousand dollars more than we're seeing today. Uh, which is quite unfortunate because everything's gone up so much, yet the funds have gone down. And I also see things like uh, policing, for example, uh, where towns uh, or municipalities less than 5,000 people in the past did not have to pay for RCMP. This year, we are paying a load of money. We're paying $87,000 towards the RCMP. Fortunately, we have a solar farm, and I'll get into that a little later, but it is has really helped to uh, cover some of those costs. But infrastructure is probably the toughest one. We're, we're going through a process right now where we're starting to line uh, sewer lines and, and so on, and staying ahead of it. We have a fairly aggressive asset management plan that we've been working on for several years now, which is helping us out. But the cost of infrastructure, I guess, is the biggest thing, not so much the infrastructure itself. Uh, I look at growth. Uh, we want to grow, cost money to grow. So what comes first, the infrastructure or, or growth? It's uh, That's what I mean by between a rock and a hard place. Can, uh, can you answer the age old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg here, Mayor? Because we got to know which <laughs> comes first, the infrastructure or the growth. Well, which comes first is the infrastructure. It has to. Uh, no sense uh, having a town that's growing if you don't have any sewers. Because that would mean nobody could flush the toilets. We'd be in big trouble. So we, we, we really have to look after infrastructure before anything else. How do you do that? And, I, and I, I, I'm not asking the stupid million dollar question here, but you're right. The aging infrastructure in a lot of small towns across the this province of Alberta and even in Bonacord is aging out. And if you do not fix it today or tomorrow, it's going to cost more in 2025 or 2026. But you have a limited supply of money and you cannot, for the love of me, for those who think municipalities can run deficits, I'm going to burst a bubble here. They can't. So therefore, you have only one source of revenue, and that is property taxes. How do you grow your community through repairing that infrastructure without doing it on the backs of the people who currently reside there? Oh, uh, it, it's it's always going to be on the backs of the people that reside here, including myself, uh, because as you just stated, it it's the taxes, the property taxes that cover all of our uh, all of our services. So. We have to find ways to uh, diversify, bring in different revenues, such as our solar farm, for example. Uh, we brought in at our solar farm between 2020 when it went in and last month uh, a, a, a credit of $406,000. So that goes a long way towards, uh, towards our services, helping us to keep our taxes down. Where of course we had people at the beginning when we had open houses and discussions about putting in a solar farm that didn't think it was a very good idea. And we also had at least one person on council that didn't think it was a very good idea. It wasn't me. <laughs> and uh, but uh, and that's life. That's that's we have to look at these people and, and say, you know what, I was there. Somebody comes up with some some ideas or, or some reasons that you shouldn't do something and you know you should you have to think back to yourself what did you think when you were back then and uh i was just like they were i i was happy that uh i had sewer and water and electricity and they were plowing the snow and and all of that good stuff but i didn't really care about anything else i didn't i knew where the money was coming from from my taxes which i thought at that time were a little bit high and uh my mind has sure changed a whole lot on that. Do you have developers knocking on your door on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis <laughs> to asking to develop? Because you, you, you laugh, but it's an important question because 
development and growth cannot be done by just the municipality alone. You can the municipalities can't go out and build massive amounts of housing or apartments. I don't care who you are, what municipality from the largest to the smallest. Municipalities are roads, sewer, wastewater, garbage. And traditionally that's their sort of roles and responsibility. That's when you need developers to come in and say, we want to build. Are developers knocking on the door? And if so, do you have to turn them away because the infrastructure growth is just not there right now? We would love it if they become not if they'd come to knock on our door, first of all. Okay. Uh, we have annexed, uh, we have close to a section of land annexed all the way around the town. And uh, we need somebody aggressive to come in and go after the developers. We Currently, we have taken on a uh, an advisor, I guess, uh, economic development advisor, uh, and we no longer have an economic development officer. That person moved on to another position somewhere else. So we are currently in the midst of doing interviews, and I just got word this morning that we may have one, and we'll find out probably during the next week. But but we're looking for somebody aggressive to go after. These developers, we have a lot of land. We have we have a lot to offer, and uh, you know what? Our town. I, I've got to tell you a little something about our town. In the past, uh, we had a council or councils way back when. It wasn't the previous council or the one before that refused to bring new business to town? People would call and say, "Well, we want to put up a store in your town." Ah, uh -uh, ain't coming here. And unfortunately, we paid the price for that because that actually sticks with a community for a long time. And I, I, I believe strongly that we've turned that corner now. We've put in some new stuff. Uh, there's a lot of interest from our residents in growth where that wasn't there before. So it, it sounds like we haven't been doing much, but we have. We've been working really hard to get out of that rut that we were in. And uh, I, I can see us moving forward from here, but we have to get developers to come in. I mean, bottom line. And we can't do it all at once, obviously, because of infrastructure, and that's that's so expensive to put in. But we have to find a way to do it. I'm going to ask a political question here, Mayor, and I apologize for throwing this in, but I've got to ask this because you kind of talked about it a little bit beforehand. Um you have seen, and I say you, the royal you, as in the town, has seen a decrease in funding from the provincial government. Now, LGFF has just come out uh, last year, and everyone got their 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 pot, if you will so eloquently call it, as I will eloquently call it, the pot of money from the uh, provincial government. And I, I don't want to ask the stupid question, but I'm going to ask it a little bit. Is it enough? What is the number you would be looking for from the province, from the federal government to help address some of these infrastructure deficits that your community is seeing? And I say deficits as in the deficit of aging infrastructure, increased growth mm. infrastructure, not in like, oh, we don't have it. It's more of the deficit of the money deficit that you need to repair and grow your community. Is there a number that you would need to sustain or potentially grow the community in a fashion that you would want it to succeed? Uh, I, I don't have a number on top of my head. We have a fabulous administration uh, staff that could answer that for you. However, uh, I can tell you what I, what I mentioned a little bit earlier, back in 2017, we, had funding that was about $300,000 more than we're seeing today, almost seven years later. So I, I think that, that tells a story right there. So we, we would need that amount plus extra. Do you, do you find yourself, and again, you as in the Royal, you as the council, holding off on infrastructure projects because you just don't have the money and therefore you're sort of playing catch up with playing catch up on top of playing catch up a little bit because you talk about the sort of the council of the past sort of not wanting to grow and they, as you say, didn't. And now you're playing catch up on what they did. And now you are playing catch up on the infrastructure deficit. It seems like you're doing a lot of catch up in Bonacord right now. Is, <laughs> would that be a, be a fair assessment? It, it would be. Uh, <laughs> keeping in mind that we have caught up a lot. 
Yeah, uh, we have a piece of property in town, by the way, that that uh, speaking of infrastructure and should we or shouldn't we, uh, we really had some long discussions on just putting water in because of the cost to do it and our budget. And uh, like, we don't want to raise taxes uh, to a point where, where the residents in town say, okay, I've had enough, I'm moving on. And, and that, that will happen for sure. But uh, we do know the need to raise taxes and that, that's where we need to bring the money in from. We do see money from different places. Like we have a, a green initiative in town going on uh, that we've received a lot of funding from the MCCAC, Municipal Climate Change Action Center, which is a partnership between uh, Alberta municipalities, rural Alberta municipalities, and or rural municipal Alberta, and uh, and the provincial government. So we're, we're seeing a lot from them, fortunately. And we've put a lot of things in. We've put in a new ice plant. We've put in the solar farm. We've We've seen money from the feds as well. Uh, yeah, However, I just I just recently chatted with the MCCA and, and MCCAC, and I can yeah. tell you they are a wonderful organization. And if anyone is in Alberta who does not know them, please check them out because they do wonderful work for a lot of municipalities across this province. There's my shameless plug for them right now. I apologize. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're absolutely right, and and we've had funding less. Say for our ice plant, we've had funding from several different areas, MCCAC, and uh, another big one would be the, the, the county. We have a deal with them uh, through our ICF, Intermunicipal Framework, global, whatever it's called. Framework, yes. Yeah. And, the, and, uh, and they're all up for renewal this year, if I'm not mistaken. So you're about to be going yeah, through discussions there. Yeah, we're doing reviews here coming up pretty quick. And it's up for renewal, I believe, in 25. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what I apologize. Um I I I I want to get this question off the, the off the sort of little sheet right now because I was accused by someone in Alberta and I keep on throwing her under the bus because I want to make sure she knows that I asked this question now because of her. Um I got accused of only talking about the negative things that are going on in the community. But I want to talk about the the accomplishments of Bon Accord for a second. Now, you've talked about this solar farm quite extensively a few times already in this interview. This has got to be a major win for your community to have such a uh, uh, entity that has offset some of the growth challenges that you have with sort of giving back through uh, revenue to the municipality, I would assume, correct? Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, I could talk about our solar farm all day. I just well, love let's it. do it. Uh, what was okay. the what was the what was the basis of this solar farm? Because um, renewable energy has been getting sort of this weird. I don't want to say taint, but weird uh, aura around it recently. But Bon Accord sort of led the way with the solar farm in the it, it, a few years ago. Was this a big win for your community? It was. It was a huge win. It, one of the nice things about it too is that we have a piece of land that is up in behind our lagoon and our fire training center that cannot be used for anything. And we took four acres of that and planted 1,728 solar panels on it. And uh, you can't even see it from the road, from the highway. You've got to drive up this little road into the lagoon to see it. Uh, we, we have tours there if you want to come, if you want to bring a group, your school classrooms or, or companies, whatever, uh, we'd be happy to take you in there and, and have a look at it because we're, we're very proud of it. So we put it in in 2020. I, I mentioned we had $406,000 uh, as of March 24. And it covers the cost of all of our town facilities for electricity. Uh, it covers the cost of the, the the town office, public works, the arena, uh, our list stations. I'm I'm sure I'm leaving some out here. I guess the only thing it doesn't directly cover, but it does in the long run, is our street lights, because they are owned and and uh, serviced by by Fortis, but it still covers those costs as well. Uh, 
Can, can I, I ask a question? Here. Does it grow? Sure. Are, are you anticipating growth on that solar uh, farm or is it sort of at its max capacity? Because while more and more municipalities are looking for alternative uh, revenue sources, I can imagine $406,000 is a lot in 2024, but I can imagine you would love to see that at 500,000 or 600,000 <laughs> years from now, two years from now, four years from now. Do you have plans to grow the solar farm or is it at the state where right now you're comfortable where it's at and you would look at it at a future endeavor? I think we'd look at it in the future. However, it's uh, it's not an easy task to grow it because it's it's uh, it's all done through Fortis and the provincial government. And there are certain stipulations in there and I don't recall what they all are. And But we are only allowed to have so much that we can put onto the grid. Uh, we're not getting paid for it in dollars, but we're putting it on the grid as, as credits. Uh, so hopefully down the road we can we can do something with it and and maybe legislation will change I don't know, but uh, of course we'd like to grow it we we've got a lot of room to double the size of that if we wanted to, uh, but where would we send the power the deal that we have with Fortis is to power the town's facilities not the residents that's a whole different matter, and uh, a whole different contract. <laughs> um. This has set up the long-term viability of your community quite well, if you ask me. And that's someone who has watched municipal politics for a few years now and has been paying attention. But when this was installed, this 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 isn't just something that is going to benefit the people of today, but it's going to benefit the people of 20 years from now as well. Was when when this came to fruition. Were, was your community rallying behind it because they saw the long-term benefits of this farm? Like you said earlier on, there was some sort of nimbyism around it and we don't want it. We, do, we don't see the benefits of it. But now looking back on that 2020 decision of switching on that light switch a little bit, do you, do you see the long-term viability of this farm and Bon Accord because of this solar farm? Uh, absolutely. You know, looking back, we had some people against it yeah. But uh, there were many, many, many that were for it and could see the long-term effects of having this farm, uh, their children and their children's children. I mean, it, it, it's, it was a wonderful thing. We had in place at that time, and, and, and we still do, uh, just, I, I mentioned before, a fabulous uh, administration staff and public work staff back at that time. And, and you know, we get, as, as a council, we get all the credit for it, eh? They all congratulate us on the solar firm we put in and how good it is. But you know what? We made all the decisions on that. Yes, financial decisions and so on. But the boots on the ground were administration and public works. And they're the ones that dealt with uh, Dandelion Renewables was the name of the company and uh, and set up all of the funding and, and uh, whatever else was required. So I just want to give them kudos for, for a job well done. Okay, you've played in the sandbox. I'm going to play in it for a little bit longer, if you don't <laughs> mind. You're right. Administrations traditionally don't get the credit for what's going on in their communities, but you've just openly said that you, you've made the decision, but it's truly the administration, the people, the boots on the ground who are making these uh, these things better for our community. How important is it for yourself and council to recognize the great work that your administration does? And I've never asked this question to anyone else but yourself. So you be honored because it's about you're about to be able to boast about the Bon Accord administration staff a little bit here. But how important is it to recognize the decisions and the, the dedication of those people in your town office and the town shop community rinks uh, i think it's just so important we need to do that these people need to have the confidence to keep moving forward and if you're not there patting them on the back and i don't mean uh just for the sake of making them feel good i mean because they've done a good job yeah uh, we are very fortunate here to have the, the the staff that we have including public works including everybody uh, we run fairly skinny as far as numbers of, of people, numbers of employees, and they do a fabulous job. Uh, we will get comments, of course, that, uh, well, I didn't get my street plowed this morning. Well, 
that's okay because we have five guys out there doing the streets and yours wasn't on the list today. So, but in general, I think it's so important. If you have uh, an administration staff and public work staff that are doing a fabulous job, let them know. Let them know how you feel about it because it's only going to get better if you do. I appreciate your candor and honesty there. And I agree with that sentiment 100%. I want to turn to my last subject now because I'm just realizing that we're at the 40 minute mark and I have not even gotten oh, wow. to my last. <laughs> exactly. That's the great thing about <laughs> these shows. They just run by very quickly. I want to talk about my favorite subject because it is something that is near and dear to my heart. And I have said on this show numerous times, and I'm trying to make that promise, uh, keep that promise to every municipal leader that I've uh, chatted to that. If you come on this show, I will come to your community and I will visit your community as a tourist spending my economic dollars. So I'm going to be up in Bon Accord later on this year because I've made this promise to you. I'm not sure when, but I'm going to make that promise that in 2024, I will be in your community. What are some of the tourist destinations besides the solar plant? Because you just said that we can go take a tour of it. What if you're coming through? What are some of the tourist destinations in and around Bon Accord that you recommend to any tourist coming to your community? Oh, I would recommend in the summertime, come on a Tuesday. Uh, we have music in the park that I mentioned earlier. Uh, for 10 Tuesday evenings, we have a different band come every week. And... Uh, we, we, we have a schedule, and you can look at the schedule to see who's coming. <laughs> you, I talked about naysayers earlier, and I looked at the schedule one week, and uh, this week it's a polka band that's coming, and I thought, oh, great, you know. And uh, But I figured, you know, I've made a commitment. I'm going to go to every one of these things, so I went. The biggest turnout ever. Everyone was up dancing and singing. I mean, it was incredible. And that's what Tuesday nights are like in Bon Accord. Uh, while you're here, you can maybe have have lunch at Chelsea's. It's the best pizza in the region. And you can ask anybody in this region and they will they will agree with that. And then we have the Golden City Bistro. You can go for supper and it's the best Chinese food around. And <laughs> Chelsea's been around for a long time. Chinese food's been around for just over a year, I guess. So music in the park is, is uh, we have people come in from all over, from all the different municipalities from the county just to see music in the park uh our solar farm of course i mentioned that is, uh, is there a place that you go to besides the music in the park after a long day of meetings after a long day of council meetings and interacting with residents is there a place in the community you can go and just decompress after a long stressful day and you can just let it all go knowing that tomorrow you're gonna have to wake back up and try to make bon accord better than you left it the day before that's a tough one. There, we need a lot of growth, of course, in Bon Accord. We don't have a lot of places to go and, and decompress, as you say. Mind you, there are some parks around. Uh, we've got a place called the Heritage Rose Garden. If you have somebody in your family that's passed, you can go and plant a rose, and it's taken care of by a group. We have Communities in Bloom. I'm sure you've heard of those. Uh, all the parks have benches, of course, that we can sit sit and just relax that, or I spend a lot of time with my wife at home. <laughs> I was going to say, come on, you have to be like every other mayor I speak to and just say, I sit at home after a long day of meetings because I just want to go home and relax. Um, I, get, I get in a roundabout way, I guess that's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to end on my last question before I let you go here, because I think it's sure. the important question. And I truly believe that at the end of the day, every municipal leader knows how to answer it, but I want to put it on the record for the show. In your opinion, what makes the town of Bon Accord such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Wow. Uh, you're probably going to get an answer that you get from everybody else. It's it's the people. Definitely the people. Uh, I go and walk down the street, and I look, and I think, well, that looks nice, and that looks nice. And then I run into somebody, and we can stand and chat forever. I haven't met a person in town that I really don't like. I mean, there's some hard heads, I guess, in town that have their opinions. But again, I love to listen to them. And if I can help them out by changing their opinion a little bit, that's great. But I, I'd say it's the people. It's uh, And I, I guess it's more likely in a small town like this than a larger 
a larger community. I everybody agree. knows everybody. Yeah. You're like cheers. Everyone knows everyone and someone's named <laughs> Norm at least once in, in that town. <laughs> Mayor Brian Thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor, honest, a good, good pleasure to have a great conversation with someone like yourself. Um, I am so honored that you took time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. And I'm so honored that I'm hopefully going to be able to come up to Bon Accord and meet with you in person and hopefully grab a slice of pizza at Chelsea's because I'm always on the hunt for the best pizza joint in Canada. So uh, I've heard a few other municipalities say they have the best pizza. So I'm making an effort to hit every single municipal pizza joint that I can over the next year and make the final pledge in December of who has the best pizza pizza so hopefully we can grab <laughs> would, a slice of pizza when i'm up there chris that would be awesome I, I want to thank you uh just for giving me the opportunity to spotlight our town uh i think it's been wonderful and i'd, I'd love to do it again sometime and look look forward to seeing you here in town now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now or hit that follow button. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can... Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking. <laughs>